Hello. Before we even start the show, I have to warn you that if you have an Amazon Echo or a Dot device nearby, please unplug it or unplug it after the first 10 minutes because we're going to say her name a lot. And uh, yeah, if you don't want her to tell you jokes or shark facts or whatever it is we ask her to do during the show, now is the time to unplug your Amazon Echo device. Hello and welcome to Embedded. I'm Elicia White alongside Christopher White. Our guest this week is Chris Mori, who is going to tell us about speech recognition. Before we get started, we will be announcing the Tinker Kit winner next week. If you enter by December 9th, it might be you. Hi, Chris. Welcome to the show. Hi, Chris. Hi, Alicia. Thanks for having me. Could you tell us about yourself? Yeah. Um, so I am the founder of a company called Conversant Labs, uh, which we build tools for designers and developers who are interested in building uh, voice-based applications, whether that's for smartphones or the Amazon uh, Echo, or really in general, um, we're really excited about voice and just making it as easy as possible to, to get that done. Excellent. And of course, we have many, many questions about that. But before that, we usually do this thing called lightning round, where we ask you short questions and we hope for short answers. And if we are behaving ourselves, we don't ask you why and how and could you tell us more. So, uh, you ready? Uh, I'll do my best. Donuts, bagels, or other ring-shaped breakfast treats? Bagels. When you do a design, should it be for new users and ease of use, or should it be for great flexibility for experienced users? Oh. Oh, man. This is sort um, of Notepad versus Emacs. Uh, I see. Uh, well, I would definitely choose Notepad over Emacs uh, <laughs> any day. Um, I think, you know, it, for the first step, it should be whatever it gets, like, your idea recorded as easily and quickly as possible, where you don't lose the thought or the, the, uh, the design. All right. Related. Form or functionality? <laughs> oh, functionality. 100%. Least favorite planet. Least favorite planet. Um, that's I don't I don't have one. I know that's sad. Um, I did go to space camp in fourth grade, so I should have an answer to this. Uh, we'll say um, Venus. Should we bring back the dinosaurs in any context? <laughs> yes. Favorite fictional robot. Oh, this is the question I couldn't come up with an answer to. I know I'm just ruining the premise of, you can just of lie. this lightning round. You can just lie. I, it's such a good question, though, and I'm very upset. Oh, uh, Data from Star Trek, Next Generation. Do you listen to podcasts? Uh, yes. What is your favorite, the show excluded? I don't think he listens to I know. <laughs> I just feel like I have to disclaim that every time. <laughs> um, there are a lot of very good ones. Um, I think the one that I am most like, I most eagerly wait for, and are most disappointed when they don't come out regularly, is the Exponent Podcast. Um, they have really good conversations about uh, the state of technology and kind of technology strategy. It's very nerdy, like techno business stuff, which is kind of trite at this point, but it's really really helpful uh, when you're running a technology company. Cool, I haven't heard that one. Yeah, that so, sounds cool. I highly, highly recommend it. What speed do you listen to podcasts at? Uh, as fast as the Overcast app will let me, uh, which is ranges from like 2.5 to 2.8. Um, but wow. if you guys know of a different podcasting app that could let me listen to it more quickly, I would uh, be very grateful. <laughs> you, you have probably a, a better vocal processing front end in your in your cranium than I do, <laughs> two point eight is pushing it. <laughs> so you 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 build yourself up to it, and this might yeah. get into a uh, longer conversation. But um, I use text to speech to read uh, most of the content that I read, uh, whether it's um, blog posts or books, and um, because my vision is is going bad, and I listen, I've worked up from you know normal reading speeds to seven hundred words a minute. That's great. And you know, after I heard him say. Uh, on a different show on the O'Reilly uh, Solid or Design, one of the O'Reilly podcasts, uh, I heard Chris say that he listened so fast and I started to bump up my overcast every time I listened to this week. And it got 
it it really it worked. I mean, I was surprised. I was up at one point eight from about one point two five, which is what I had been listening. And <laughs> it was yeah, it worked as long as I didn't jump. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so now we should talk about why you're here, um, which actually is one more lightning round question. Okay. Voice recognition or speech recognition? I would say speech recognition. I think that's the more standard um, you, word choice. Because that's what the academics use. Because we don't really care about recognizing voices unless you're doing passcodes and right. what so, you really care about is speech. Right. right. So I think when you're talking about taking audio and turning it into text, that would be speech recognition. I think voice would, like you said, would be more closely associated with identifying who is doing the speaking. Uh, so like speaker identification. Um, and that's also really, really helpful and useful, um, but we're, we're not really there yet. Well, from a more mundane perspective, VR is already an overloaded acronym. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, so... Speech recognition, and that leads to Siri and Alexa. And should we not use that word? Alexa or Siri? Alexa, tell me a no, joke. No, don't do this to people. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. We uh, every phone call I have, uh, someone's uh, echo goes off uh, without fail. Okay, so there, there's Siri and Alexa something, and these. These are the two most well-known speech recognition things. And Google. And Google, Google Voice. I don't know what the keyword is. Google Now, I think, or something. It's now, uh, it's Google Assistant. Okay. Will it tell me a joke, too? Probably. Not a good one. Well, Alexa, Alexa, some things are also terrible. So, oh, uh, actually, Google hired um, uh, screenwriters and comedians to do their script writing. And so the jokes on Google Assistant are significantly better than uh, Amazon Echo. And, and this, this is actually, for everyone listening, this is what I use my e Echo for. I, it, it has to tell me jokes. It sets timers. It occasionally plays music, but it mostly tells me jokes. And if you think that is worth the $50 entry price... I have to say it was for me because the jokes are awful. <laughs> but, okay, so Alexa seems better than Siri. And Alexa, stop. Um, and so why is that? So so this gets um, to kind of what the latest kind of technological innovation in the last couple of years is in speech recognition. Uh, so Siri has been around for a handful of years now, and she's finally gotten good enough, as with all the other services, at understanding what we say. So she can recognize the words that we're saying with a very high percentage of accuracy, you know, not no matter the environment and no matter the accent. Um, what she still struggles with and what Alexa does a better job of is understanding what we mean. Um, so, you know, the vast majority of the time, Siri will just punt your query uh, or command to a Bing web search where um, Alexa is much more um, focused on like application-specific actions and enabling developers to um, build apps that can respond to your specific requests. Um, so so the, the difference is this ability to understand uh, the meaning of the words that you are using. And Alexa has done a much better job of that and um, Google Assistant as well. But they all go to the internet. They do all go to the internet. Um, though, um, starting with iOS 10 and with uh, Apple has said that speech recognition uh, w can be done on device for certain devices. Um, and they haven't been very specific about that. Probably the newest. <laughs> yeah. Right, but yeah. right. Um, so you said they all get pretty good at recognizing. That is not my experience. It's my experience. Is it, <laughs> is it because I, is it because I talk wrong? Um, is it because I have a higher voice and they're trained for male voices? Is it because I tend to do the stupid pauses and then sort of sing for the rest of my sentence? I, if I had to pick one, it would probably be the last one that you said. Um, I'm sure that the um, data, so the way that all of these systems work is by collecting tons and tons and tons of data of 
you know, audio recordings of different people speaking with different accents and cadences and frequencies and different environments, and then using that to train uh, machine learning to recognize, you know, the next time someone says something. Um, so I would have I would imagine that the data is very or fairly representative of the broader market. So, you know, men and women of all age groups. Um, but I think, you know, being more sing-songy and, and your elocution uh, might throw Siri for a loop uh, in the same way that Siri and speech recognition in general has a really hard time with kids um, because their, their voices are, are significantly uh, higher pitched. And it is true that shouting uh, at the devices works better. Of course, that's going to be more <laughs> clipped. So, so I think that gets into uh, another factor, which is the quality of the microphones on the device that you're using. So if you're using Siri uh, very close to your mouth, um, she's going to do a better job of understanding you because the microphones in general are tuned for that distance where Alexa on the Amazon Echo and the Amazon uh, Echo Dots are, uh, they say, far field microphones. So they, they've done a lot of work um, to be able to understand speech at far distances, which in my experience with Siri, uh, she's nowhere near as good at. And not even, not even like understanding what I'm saying, but just even hearing, hey, Siri. Well, that's going to be definitely true because Siri has one microphone, maybe two, uh, and Alexa's got five or something. And so she can do beam forming and be able to hear things far more clearly by augmenting the signal from the different microphones. Right. That's, right. that's why the echo dots can like put a light on that shows where it thinks you're coming from. Oh, I've not noticed that, but that's really cool. Uh, are the underlying technologies between these really different? I mean, as far as I understand, at the very lowest level, you come in through the microphone, you do some signal processing, you grade it into pauses, which is where I probably fail, and then you try to build up the phonemes from the uh, frequency information. And once you have phonemes, then you can start to build words, and then words, and then sentences, and you do some matching. Is so, that all the same for all of them, or do they do special stuff? I, I, I would say at this point, uh, it's going to be very similar across all the platforms. Um, and the only thing that's going to vary is, you know, the data set that they're using. You know, Google had their Google Voice um, product that they used to collect all of this data, speech data to train so that they could transcribe voicemails. Um, and then that's now powering their speech recognition. I think, you know, for the speech recognition, it really is going to be very similar and there aren't going to be major differences where and and moving forward where the differences are going to emerge is uh, or the differences in quality I should say are in the understanding what you mean with your words uh, so so the voice applications that we use whether it's Siri or Alexa there's the speech recognition piece and then there's the um, natural language understanding piece um, and that's taking the text that it's transcribed from the speech recognition and trying to assign uh, meaning or intent to, to those phrases. And the uh, like the speech recognition, the underlying technology um, relies on machine learning and is, is similar, um, but it relies much more on the data, which we haven't really built up that data set because, you know, with speech data, you just need people talking. But with the natural language understanding, you need data from people, you know, booking flights, from interacting with calendars, from whatever that action is. You need data of people talking and expressing the intent to complete that action. Um, so, so those are kind of, I think, in terms of the differences in experiences moving forward or across Alexa and Google Assistant and Google Home and Siri, it's going to be because of the amount of data they have for those specific uh, intents. And so that's like... If I want to make a meeting on January 12th, 2017, I can phrase that a thousand different ways, whether it's meeting 9 a.m. January 20, whatever I said, um, or whether it's book an appointment Jan 12 or Monday after next or whatever. I have all of these different ways I can phrase that. They may all mean the same thing. Is that the sort of thing you're so talking about? 
that's that's exactly right. So with the calendar example, there's the different uh, kind of words you choose to use. So like make a you know I um, make an appointment, make a calendar event. Uh, I need to go do this thing. I have a meeting. So there's that piece, and then there's the um, the pieces of information you need to complete that task of creating a calendar event. So you need the date and you need the time and then you need like a label. And so not only can you express the desire to create that calendar event differently, you can uh, not provide all the information you need. So then you have to collect that data. So like the app would have to ask you, you know, what time on Saturday would you like your event to be scheduled for? Uh, but you can also put those in all different orders. So you could say the time before the date before the label or the label, then the time and then the date. And so that's that all that complexity has to be um, solved for. And luckily, calendaring is one of these common tasks that we, they've been working on for, for years now, so it's gotten better. But that same complexity uh, is there whether you're making a calendar event or you're ordering a pizza or um, you know playing Jeopardy on the Jeopardy skill. And that gets to another uh, kind of a third piece of this beyond recognition and natural language processing is kind of a mental model or state machine because it's one thing to say, take an action and have it respond and, and take that action. But it's another to keep context and mm -hmm. keep a conversation going, right? And that's sort of a, a new piece, I think, that's that's still being explored. Yeah, absolutely right. So um, the amount of state uh, that is managed in current voice applications is very limited, um, where it's limited to these, uh, you know, question and answer or question and answer with a clarification. So like if you don't provide all the information you need, the app will ask you for it. Um, the next step is to be able to maintain your state in kind of a multi-step process. So not necessarily a longer conversation, but being able to, um, for example, uh, cook through a recipe. So, you know, there's the an original, like you open your voice application and you search for a recipe. So there's the search for a recipe state. Then once you, then there's the search results for that recipe state. Then there's once you've selected the recipe, there's that state. And then there's the step you are in that recipe as you're cooking through it and or the ingredients in the list. And so being able to track each of those states is definitely doable, um, but not really supported. Or we haven't seen that yet uh, in uh, voice applications on you know the Amazon Echo, and then beyond that is like a robust full conversation uh, where you can just go back and forth on whatever topic. Uh, and Amazon just um, announced a two point five million dollar prize uh, for uh, that twelve different academic teams are competing for to try and create um, a an app using Alexa's. Uh, APIs that can hold a conversation for 20 minutes. For 20 minutes? Yeah, which wow. I think is a pretty pretty hard problem. That's a lot of state. I mean, mm -hmm. there are some Alexa games that uh, you can play that have some state. There's one that you battle robots and <laughs> it's sort of fun, but it is definitely one of those you could play it on a board and it would be pretty trivially easy to see where your robot is and what it's done and what the other robots are doing. But it feels a little conversational. Like it's like it's the dungeon master and you're playing Dungeons and Dragons sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you'd get beyond that. So, yeah, I think there's... A lot of challenges from as like the user of these experiences, where um, you know, with a visual application, like you said, if the board is in front of you, we can. It's a lot easier for us to understand where we are and what all the actions we can take are, um, and that discoverability of what you can do is is I think one of the biggest problems with um, Siri on the iPhone, right? Or Google Assistant or Cortana, these general virtual assistants where um, you don't know what she can do and you don't know how to say the right thing to get her to do what you want her to do. So the discoverability oh, yes. of those interactions is really, really hard. I think Amazon has done a really good job with this skill model, um, which people are used to 
applications on an uh, an iPhone or on a uh, websites on the web, and so skills for voice like you are limiting uh, what the user can do to the very specific context of that skill, and then because it's so limited, it's easier to kind of intuit what you can do. So and and like searching for recipes or. If you're in a recipe app, chances are you can search for a recipe. If you're in a shopping app, chances are you can search for a product, get reviews for that product, and purchase that product. Um, so by limiting the context, it makes it a lot easier, not only on the technology side and understanding what the user is saying, but on the user side for them to know what they can say. And that is such a huge problem. Uh, I mean, in Siri, I can ask what the tides are, which is something we go to the beach and I always want to know what the tides are now. Is it going out? Is it coming in? Christopher doesn't always like to get his feet wet. So I need to know how far we can go. (laughs) This is false. It's sort of false. Uh, And so if I go to Siri, there is one particular phrasing that will lead me to the tides. All the other phrasings. I mean, I Siri, what are the tides? Nope. What are the tides today? What are the, is the tide coming in? None of those work. I have to find exactly the right phrasing. And, and it, it changes. Makes, and, it, and it does change, which makes me crazy. Yeah. Um, so I don't know um, exactly how Siri's like internal architecture is that um, leads to that specific outcome. But if that same problem were to happen on Alexa, or in a specific skill. So if you had the tide skill for Alexa and you said, Alexa, ask the tides, uh, ask tides when the high tide is, um, the whole, the, the primary responsibility of the app developer for that skill is to collect the thousand different ways that you are going to ask for tide information so that it will recognize what you say in your natural language without having to think about the right way to say it and then be able to respond. Because like you just talked about, if you say it and it doesn't understand, you're going to have this expectation that it doesn't work or you're going to get really frustrated because you know it does. You know it can tell you the tide, um, but you just can't communicate effectively. Uh, and, And so that... Uh, being able to understand what the user said is like the core problem in voice computing right now and is the number one responsibility of the app developer uh, when they're building their app. And it's a real adoption problem too because on paper, you know, if something works 90% of the time, that sounds pretty good, right? Oh, I can talk to my computer and it responds and does what I say 90% of the time. But the truth is if something doesn't work 10% of the time, I think most people are just going to stop trying. Yeah, um, it's it's a big problem, and I think it's um, things like Amazon and Google are trying to to work on, which is for that ten percent when it doesn't understand. There's kind of two um, possible reasons for that. One is it just completely doesn't understand what you're saying, and so like there's nothing it can do. Um, But then there's also the case where it does understand what you're saying. It just doesn't have that functionality, right? So for the tide example, if you said, when's the high tide, um, you know, next next Tuesday at 8 p.m., it could understand that request and instead, but not be able to respond. So instead of not responding with that information, say, sorry, I don't know when the high tide is next week or something like that. Um, So by being... By the application responding with, like saying, hey, I hear you, I just can't help you. It helps to like um, teach the, the user to be more um, experimental in the requests that they're saying. How important is it to have that be uh, a human interaction? I mean, you were saying... We want our, we want the app to be able to say I can't do that, and I was thinking I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. <laughs> Would be hilarious to me once, maybe twice. But is it as you design these interactions? How much do you have it be efficient, and how much do you have it be personable? I I have very strong opinions on this, um, which is to say you should avoid personality as much as possible unless you have a really, really, really good reason to have personality um, because it gets really annoying. Like personality is cute when 
they like did something right for you, but personality makes you want to throw <laughs> your phone against the wall when yes. it doesn't do what you want it to. Um, and it, it even gets annoying, like, uh, and I hate to bash on Siri, but like every single thing I ask her to do, like there's some cute turn of phrase in the response. Like if it's cold outside, she'll go, or um, like she'll, um, when it's raining outside, she'll be like, don't forget to bring an umbrella. Um, and it's like, just gets really tedious after a while where like we don't expect our computers to have personality when we go like do a Google search. We just want the information that we're asking for. So until we, you know, go from ninety percent accurate to ninety eight percent accurate or higher, I think personality is only going to uh, get in the way of a good user experience. I can see that. It would yeah. be fun for a little while, but I just want it to work. Spend less time right. messing around, making neat features, and more time. Right. And this and this kind of gets back to the to the jokes, which is like it's great that you can tell me jokes, but I'd much rather you be able to tell me, you know, what my latest email is or what my latest text message was. I can see that, although that's not how I use it because <laughs> I, if I'm in the kitchen I don't really want to play with my email. I I do right. that all the or, other times. Or, and you're not the only one. I think the majority of people who have uh, the Amazon Echo or the Google Home have them in or near their kitchen. So if not email, you know, it'd be great if she could um, help you cook through recipes or order yeah. groceries or order food from you know, Uber Eats or Grubhub or something or make a restaurant reservation. And I do think that we haven't used the shopping list yet, but I do think that could be useful. Um, because you're standing there and you you just ran out of oatmeal. Okay, Alexa, add oatmeal to my shopping list would be useful. Christopher's shaking his head like, like you haven't all unplugged them by now. So that's what you do. You actually design, help people design these conversational methodologies. Yeah, so um, we have a tool called TinCan.ai, uh, T-I-N-C-A-N.ai, which... Um, does two things. One is it helps you prototype a voice application. So um, right now, it's really hard to go through the design process with voice apps. Um, you know, wireframing doesn't really work for non-visual experiences. Like you can draw the outline of what your mobile app is going to look like and you get a good sense of how that app is going to behave, but you can't do that with a voice app. You can say, like create sample scripts, like the app says this and the user says this and the app says this, um, but that doesn't, it's only so helpful and you can't do user testing with that. So um, that's the point of this prototyping tool is to for designers and, and developers to very quickly be able to like mock up how their voice app is going to behave and then put that in front of users to do user testing. And the, the reason that's so important, which is what we've been talking about this whole time, is so you can collect the data of how people are going to interact with your skill. What are the f ways that they're going to phrase the questions that you expect them to ask? Because uh, there's just so many different ways. And so we help you to collect that data uh, so that when you do release your skill, it's going to be more responsive to you know, um, all the different ways that people are going to talk to it. So does it end up being a sort of a natural language processing problem where you have this giant tree of options and it's one of those and you just have to build the tree? So um, yes and no. So it is very much a natural language processing problem. Um, but the, the way that the limitations of voice computing right now is there's not really a tree. There's um, a set of actions a user can take uh, called intents, and all of those intents are active at the same time. So if a user is using your skill and says something to activate those intent, uh, an intent, that intent will be activated, and then it'll call a function for your app to take an action against that. And that action could be you know, to look up the low tide uh, time and speak it back to the user, or it could be to look up the low tide time, oh, they didn't give me uh, a location, so to ask the user for that location and then speak them the time. Um, and so you need all of the data to be able to recognize when a user has expressed that intent uh, and, then, um, and then you also have to specify 
uh, the different types of data that you're going to receive from that voice request. So it's like a date and time, a physical location, a proper noun, a phone number, and, and things like that. And so there's some overlap between applications because anything having to do with the date and time can come in all of the ways a calendar meeting can be requested. Right, right. So um, Amazon has this and most natural language services out there that you might want to use for a voice app like uh, Microsoft's Lewis or Facebook's wit.ai or Google's api.ai will have um, not only built-in intents for common interactions like uh, confirmations like yes, no, cancel, go back, those types of things, um, but also the common data types like calendars um, and phone numbers and things. It feels like you're building a whole new programming language. It, it, is, very, um, it is a very new way of doing things. <laughs> that wasn't a yes or no, but okay. <laughs> no, no, so it's, you're, you're relying on the same programming languages. Like you can build a, an Alexa skill in whatever language you want, JavaScript, Java, anything that can run on a server and you can create, uh, you know, connect uh, to Amazon over the uh, an IP, uh, sorry, over HTTP, um, and it's just that like the architecture is different and relies so heavily on speech recognition and on natural language processing. So like the requirements of um, implementing natural language processing has a lot of nuances very specific to that process that we haven't really had to deal with before. But it's not really coding, it's um, just like data collection and design. Um, okay. Yeah. I, I, I often see many problems as coding. So the, the grammar generation seems like the same sort of grammar generation you would use if you were building another language. But I do, I, yes, I see many things as coding problems. <laughs> so what sort of tactical advice like things that if I was building a, a, a interface, what are the, the first five things you tell people to look out for? This variability has got to be one of them, but what else? Like, So I, is it okay if I answer like the steps that I would take in thinking through d- designing a voice app? Sure. Yeah, so I would be... Um, the first step is to like clearly define the actions that a user can take, um, and and so I, let's go with this example of of the Tide app. So if you want to be able to report to users uh, when the high and low tides are for a given day and for a given beach, that means they're going to have to you know they're going to ask for the high tide they're going to ask for the low tide they're going to ask for the tide table for that day they're going to be ask for a specific beach uh, they're going to or a specific location and they may even ask qualitative questions like is today a good day to go surfing um, and so they're in the first step it's to think of all the different actions a user is going to want to take and the step the second step is to limit what you are going to support to a very concrete set of actions. So like in the first version, you may want to limit it to just the tied tables and uh, I'll put off questions, uh, like qualitative questions on what that means for different uh, water activities. Um, then step two is to cl- like think through all of the ways that people are going to express those different actions and the different ways they're going to form those questions. And then step three is to, once you've come up with everything that you can think of, then you have to go ask other people uh, or do testing with other people to see how they're going to express those same um, questions. Because no matter how many you can think of on your own, what other people are going to say is going to be dramatically uh, different. Uh, So you have to be able to to account for that. Like, Um, Like, is the tide coming in would have been one of my questions. Right, exactly. Which is totally uh, solvable with the problem with the data set you have already, but it it wasn't in your list. So yeah, you have to ask what other people think because you're not going to get all the answers yourself. Go on. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and then once you have that, it's a very, you know, a pretty trivial uh, coding problem. Um, 
uh, Alexa skills as they exist today are just when you Alexa, the Echo will tell you when an intent is activated. It'll um, call a specific function, and that function will just need to uh, access the data that you have, um, and then you speak that data back to the user, and you like um, generate the response. And that is just a complicated way of saying, you know, writing out the text that the app is going to say. Um, and then that's really it. That sounds so easy. <laughs> it it I, and that's. <laughs> That's the thing is it really isn't rocket science. Um, it's just, I, I think, where mobile and web development is, you know, there's considerable amounts of software development involved. Uh, and then design is kind of goes hand in hand with that and it makes the product better. Uh, voice is significantly less complicated on the software engineering side, but relies significantly more on good design and the design process and doing user testing to collect the data that's going to power um, that voice application. That makes a lot of sense. If you're getting to 90% uh, success rate and all you need to do is listen to a few more things your users are asking for and figure out how to map them into the functions you already have to get to 96%, that seems so worth it. Right, right. It, it absolutely is. And it, it, it kind of is similar to um, traditional application development with analytics and seeing how people are interacting with your application and then focusing on the parts of the application where people aren't doing well. Um, but where traditionally you have to come up with your own ways of making that process easier for the user with voice you know what they're saying. You know what they're trying to do that you don't understand. So all you have to do is retrain on that that expression you didn't understand or add the features to support um, that expression that the user requested that you couldn't respond to before. Um, so just by like listening to the user uh, becomes so much more important but is also so much easier with, with voice. So before we get off the topic of general uh voice, speech, <laughs> natural language processing, I, and application design. Um, one thing you haven't mentioned is localization and, and supporting multiple languages. That seems like a really big problem. Um, it's the same problem, though. You have to go from what's input. Is it, though? Because you have to repeat what we're it, saying about you know collecting ways people could ask questions or, or, or signify their intent. That, that can be quite different in different languages. You can have idioms. Uh, it's That's, just, you're you're exactly right. You're exactly right. Where, you know, historically, localization is just translating your website or your app into another language. With voice, not only do you have to do that, but you have to do this data collection in those other languages. Um, so, you know, Amazon Alexa is available in the US, the UK, and Germany. And... So for Ger the German version, you have to translate your skill to speak back in German. But then you also have to get the user utterances uh, or the expressions that people are going to use and speak to your app in German. Um, and then also in British English, because idioms, like you said, are going to be different. So the localization problem is um, greater than it has been before, and but is the same process of building the voice app in the first place. You just have to repeat it for every language that you're going to be supporting. That's sort of like how you have to do that for numbers when you have an embedded system and you want to output numbers. They're all different. Yeah, it's a, you know, it's, it's a repeat of a large data set collection. It it's is. Just, it's not quite the same as shoving an Excel spreadsheet to a translation company and having it come back. That never works as well as people think anyway. Well... <laughs> Okay, so I want to move on to a different topic. We've been talking about these applications that go to the net. And I have to admit, I don't really like it. One of the reasons I didn't get an Echo sooner was because I really don't like the fact that it goes out to the net. Um, I have privacy issues with it, and I have issues with both Siri and the Echo uh, failing to get to the network for some stupid reason, even though everything else in the house is fine. Um, 
do we, are, how long are we going to be stuck going out to the net to do things? When can we do it here? That is a, a good question. Um, I think the limiting factor right now is the speech recognition. Um, it's still very processor intensive to convert audio into text and doing the machine learning, uh, running the machine learning algorithms um, and classifiers on that data to the point where it requires, you know, offloading to the internet. But once you have that text, the natural language processing, on the other hand, is a much less processor intensive. Um, the training that itself is very processor intensive, and that takes, you know, lots of GPUs running for hours to to get right. Um, but once that model is trained, the actual classification is is much more straightforward. So it's not, you know, speech recognition is one thing, but the, and I think we're getting there. So hopefully in the next couple of years, we'll be able to do um, on-device speech recognition over a an open dictionary. So like not so like right now you can do it with a fixed number of words um, in the tens to hundreds, like so less than 500. Um, but hopefully in the next couple of years, we'll get to the place where you can do open speech recognition, uh, where you can just listen for anything and get the text of that hopefully. Um, and that, once we have that, that's kind of the limiting factor because of, uh, or at least with respect to speech input. Um, I don't really know, I don't have a sense of what the text-to-speech requirements would be. Because um, all of those, oh no, you can do that on device now. I'm sorry. Yes, oh, definitely, to, yes. Uh, yeah. Um, so, you know, text-to-speech you can do on device, and uh, the natural language processing you can do on device, but there's no way, there's no no services that let you do that right now. So you would have to uh, build your own, essentially, um, which is uh, a lot more complicated than it should be. Um, so it's just going to, technically it's not a problem, it's just that isn't available right now. And then I, think, I still think it's a couple of years away before we can do speech recognition uh, on device. There are some dev kits out there. There's the Easy VR, which is easy voice recognition on SparkFun. It's a $50 Arduino shield. And it's got a number of commands that are built in. There are things like robot stop, robot go, robot turn. And it's supposed to work pretty well. And you can add things to it. It also supports... Uh, five languages, including U.S., so that would be six languages. But it only supports, as you said, a very small dictionary. You can train it for a few more, but it's not going to be long sentences. It's not going to be, tell me a joke. It's going to be, joke now, joke cat, joke shark. Yeah, really, this is all I use her for. Uh, <laughs> and then there, there's another one, a $20 one from... Seed Studios, the Grove Speech Recognizer, that's a Cortex M0 Plus based, and it has 22 commands, which is pretty cool. But again, that's not a dictionary. And if you think about the Cortex M0 Plus and how small it is and how efficient it is, that has a lot of goodness, but I suspect they're pushing that as hard as it can go. And they're still only getting 22 commands. If they put, if they added Flash or whatever they needed to, or RAM probably to, to do more, they would need to have a bigger processor because you have to compare all of these phonemes against your, uh, your signal processor gives you phonemes. And then the phonemes you have to compare to your uh, dictionary of phonemes. And that process is very intensive and takes a while and you want your device to be able to respond very quickly. It's one of the things that all of the ones we've been talking about do respond to you almost immediately unless they've gone off to the net and fallen down. But when they work, it, it's a snappy back and forth. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Uh, oh, I have the, the Radio Shack has been doing... Uh, uh, voice recognition or speech recognition chips since 1980. Well, and, I don't and think they're still how doing well it. is that working out? I don't. Remember. I think it worked. 
<laughs> how many how many commands did it have? Uh, you know, a dozen or something. I don't remember what it was, but it was a little masked ROM with a tiny microprocessor. It was like ten bucks in an IC. It was for the robot kind of thing, like you were saying. But they have to be pretty separate uh, sentence words. I mean, you they have don't to sound do really different. You mean on and off are terrible. Um, start and stop are not great because those are both words that sort of sound like each other. Um, if you say, well, there's, yeah, you want to do things that sound different. Open and closed sound very different. That's a good, good thing. But so, for natural language processing, it's not a good thing. Right. I was going to say, um, I'm not as familiar with the boards that are out there, but um, on the software side, there's an open source on-device speech recognition library um, from Carnegie Mellon called uh, Pocket Sphinx. And it is a on-device speech recognition um, engine that, again, has limited dictionaries, but is much, um, much higher numbers that it will support. Uh, I think in the hundreds, but it's going to require, you know, a full um, kind of Linux uh, computer on a chip. Um, so maybe it, you could run it on like the new chip, um, like eight dollar PC or something like that. Um, yes. But yeah, that's another thing to if people are interested in that might be worth exploring. <laughs> Their links are all broken, darn it. Mm -hmm. uh, I will put a link in the show note that actually works instead of inside. Just sending, never mind. I, I'll send you good links on that if you want to check the show notes for Pocket Sphinx. Uh, and there was another group, Audemy. Uh, they were on the Amp Hour, which is sort of our... S brothers, I almost said sister show, but... The doesn't work exactly. We'll go with brother, cousin, sworn enemy show. Second cousin show. <laughs> um, and they talked a lot about the technology of putting it together, but that's a, that's a $70 Linux based part that wow. it, if you want to, and you know, that that's retail. I mean, it's maker retail. So assume that you could actually get those parts for 10 to $20 yeah. and put them in your device and it would all work. But that means your cost has to go way up and it starts to make sense why we aren't doing these locally. <laughs> but someday, I mean, Moore's Law works for us, then then that will be cheaper soon. And in 10 years, we'll just be walking around talking to ourselves without cell phones. I, yeah. I, I mean, I think we're going to be, we're definitely going to be walking around talking to ourselves uh, very soon. Uh, it's just definitely going to reply on the internet and, you know, a company is going to be able to record all of that. Well, that's, you're not helping my privacy concerns here. <laughs> so, so I think the privacy concerns are, are very valid and it's a very, um, probably the tech technology issues aside, privacy concerns are the biggest issue facing a wider adoption of really, really interesting things that we can do with voice um, because of, just, you know, companies using that data and knowing everything about you and then governments doing the same uh, in, in this country and, and others. And it, I think people are going to have a very, um, you know, justified negative response if we push that too far forward. So I think in order to kind of see the, the full potential of what we can do with voice computing, um, we're going to need more privacy protections like written into law um, and uh, <laughs> I don't know when that's going to ever happen. Well, let's not go further down that path today. Okay, okay. <laughs> but I, I agree, we, we're going to have to sort this out because well, it's all there. Different companies had different attitudes towards it. I mean, Apple at least consistently up to now has been very you know, privacy is one of our product features. And so, you know, I think they would be pushing hard to get stuff processing locally. And then it's just a matter of, okay, you're doing a web search or you have text going up to the web. Or uh, text going to your apps. 
but it's not consistently listening to everything you're saying and yeah. potentially having a privacy hole there. But uh, it's going to be interesting to see if consumers make that something that they want, I guess, because if they don't, then it's kind of incumbent on companies to force it on them. That's no, we're going to do this. It's going to take us a little longer to make this truly safe for you. Can you be patient? Right. All right. Let's, let's, uh, let's move on. We were connected through the O'Reilly design conference. You'll be speaking there next spring. What are you going to talk about? Yeah, I'm going to be running a workshop on uh, designing and prototyping voice-based applications. So I think we're going to talk, go in more depth into the topics that we covered today. Like, um, what are the underlying technologies that are making this wave of voice computing possible? And what does that mean for what you can do as a voice app uh, developer and designer? And then what are the uh, design considerations and best practices in voice uh, user interface design? And then we're actually going to sit down and prototype uh, a voice app together um, using um, our, the, the prototyping tool that we've created. And then we'll do user testing with other people in the workshop. Uh, and hopefully, you know, I'm really excited to see what, what people come up with. Do you think people will bring their apps and say, how do I do this? I, I hope so. I think that'll be, uh, make for a much more interesting workshop. I think uh, I'm curious to see, like one of the big things that I want to talk about is does it make sense for your use case for there to be a voice application? Because uh, not everything, at least today, should have a voice app um, because of the limitations and just what makes sense, right? I don't think people are going to be doing a lot of uh, clothing shopping on their Amazon Echo. And yet she tries. <laughs> what apps are really good candidates? I mean, jokes aside, what what should we be looking for soon so i think um the kind of the general question that should be asked is um given the context that the user is in like their physical environment and what they're doing does voice provide a more efficient means of completing that task than other possibilities um and that's kind of where Echo has done a really good job is in the home, most people don't have their phones on them. So having a device that is just there that you can talk to is going to be a better experience than having to go find your phone and then pick it up and complete that task. Um, especially for interacting with your connected home. Like um, it's a lot easier to say, Alexa, turn on the lights than it is to either get up off the couch and go hit the light switch or pull out your phone from your pocket, <laughs> you open up totally your smart app. I've seen Chris try to turn on the lights recently. It took him like 12 tries. It would have been so much easier to go stand over there. But yes, sorry. No, uh, I think there's an entire other episode that can be done on just how frustrating the smart home is. Uh, as an as a consumer, um, but but yeah, so like that's the overarching question: is does voice provide a more efficient means of completing a task than other alternatives? And then you have to ask that for uh, your so your specific use case, but also for the device you're building for. And right now, you know, most people who are thinking about voice, I think, are thinking about it on the Amazon Echo and the Google Home. Uh, when that opens up to developers later this month. And so given that 50% uh, or more of people who have an Echo have them in or near their kitchen, like companies uh, that are related to food or cooking or kind of the f family group experience are going to lend themselves much better uh, in the short term to, to voice computing. So anything with recipes, with food ordering, with restaurant reservations and food search, those types of tasks, I think, are, are very well suited right now. It could change channels on the TV, too. That would be nice. It, it can if you have a Logitech Harmony. Um, and that's one of my next purchases because I would really uh, <laughs> like to set that up. Which clearly we do not. <laughs> Behind the timeline technology. It's clearly a business expense. Uh, okay, so what apps don't make good candidates for voice recognition. You, you mentioned clothing, and I could see how like some of the picture-only, like Pinterest probably wouldn't be right. that useful. <laughs> 
right? Any things that are, are, are very visual, at least right now, are not going to make sense. You know, there are whispers that Amazon's coming out with a, a, an Echo with a touchscreen, so that might be better, but still probably not going to be better than just using it on your phone. Um, so anything heavily visual, anything where you uh, are kind of communicating very uh, sensitive information, so not necessarily secretive, but that also counts. Um, so like credit card information or like pers- uh, your address, things that if you get that piece of information wrong, um, it's gonna just the experience of trying to do that through speech is going to be very poor and and not great. So I would avoid anything that has to rely rely on that. Um, yeah, there are some phone tree applications that want you to say your social security number, and I always I'm like. You have no idea where I am. I could be in a coffee shop. This isn't the sort of thing you want me to do out loud. <laughs> right, right. Um, I think that kind of gets to one of the other kind of things to keep in mind with the Echo is it's a public device in your home. And unless you live by yourself, other people are going to either overhear the conversation that you're having or be able to access that same data. And so, you know, we talked about email a little earlier, but that's, I think, an example of something that people might not be comfortable doing um, on a on this public or shared device. Uh, so, anything with like very personal information, like mental health or or email or like journaling. Or other other things like of that nature, I don't think are good fits for kind of voice computing as it exists today. I think that'll change very quickly, um, but right now, probably not. That makes sense. There, there are a lot of things that I could see in that whole stuff you don't tell everybody all the time bucket. Right. Cool. Well, it does sound like it's going to be an interesting tutorial. Let's see. You care about voice recognition a lot, clearly, and you, or speech recognition, and how it's designed. And you mentioned that you use a screen reader. What is that like? Uh, Extremely, extremely frustrating. Uh, So the reason I got into this whole space is uh, because five years ago I found out that I was going blind. Uh, I was diagnosed with a genetic disorder where I'm losing my central vision. And as my vision has gotten worse over that period of time, I've gotten very familiar with uh, the assistive technology that's out there and and specifically the screen reader. Uh, And I'm very disappointed with, with, how they work and the experience of using that product. Um, and and for those of you who aren't familiar, a screen reader is a device for the visually impaired or a software for the visually impaired, where um, there's a cursor on the screen that you can move using um, keyboard commands on a laptop or swipe gestures on a smartphone. And whatever that cursor highlights um, is that text is read aloud or the metadata for that text is read aloud. Um, So you're navigating this two-dimensional visual experience in a one-dimensional audio stream using keyboard commands. And it's very cumbersome. And that's even only when it works well. Like a lot of websites and a lot of mobile applications don't take the steps necessary to make their products accessible. Um, And so this creates a really poor experience for you know, the vast majority of the blind community, um, not to mention the fact that most people are losing their vision from aging related disorders. So they're, you know, very unlikely to know how to do email, let alone use email with the screen reader and other assistive technology. So um, voice and voice computing like represents this much better way of doing things where these applications are designed for audio first and they're going to be a much more intuitive experience uh, for someone who's less tech tech savvy um, and and conversation is something that we've all been doing since we've been able to talk so it's much more comfortable uh, so I really optimistic and really hopeful that in the near future, we're going to be able to do everything we can do on our smartphones through through voice instead. So you didn't, as we were talking about apps that weren't necessarily good candidates, you didn't mention things you want to do fast. And as I think about screen readers and what 
how hard it is to navigate a website. I imagine that that is incredibly slow and that these speech conversational things are also pretty slow. And you said you listen to podcasts really fast. How do we get these to be slow? I've always found in meetings, I'm like, can't we just do this over IM where we can all type faster? <laughs> yeah. I So I think a big part is just letting you increase the speech rate of your voice service. Um, and so... Um, that's a standard feature in screen readers that I would love to see on Alexa or Siri or Google Assistant. And that would help make these interactions more efficient. Um, <laughs> Alexa, talk faster. Will that work? No, it won't. Will it? It, it, it doesn't work. But I was waiting to see what she would say back to you. Oh, no, she's in a different room. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, no, I wish, I wish. Um so, so that's one thing that we can do. But again, that's like more for for power users who are used to it. Um, the it's just it's I think other things that we can do to make the experiences more efficient are just being more responsive to more natural language commands rather than having to force you to go through a sequence of very specific commands. Uh, one and then two allow you to make multiple requests in the same. Um, the same kind of interaction. Uh, I'm trying to think of a good example of that. Um, like set two timers, one for five minutes and one for 10 minutes. Like that's not a great one, but an idea of like that would be more efficient than saying Alexa set a timer for five minutes, Alexa set a timer for 10 minutes. Um, and there's also like there, there's UI things that you can do to make the experience more efficient. Um, that I think will will help kind of move us in, in that direction. But that's difficult. I mean, the timers is not too difficult because you're going to the same app in the end. But if I wanted to say, uh, put eggs on my grocery list and remind me to go to the grocery before I go home, those are two separate apps. And so you have to have enough upper level natural language processing to split it between them. Yeah. Yeah, um, you're exactly right. And I think that's going to be a challenge for these platforms. And the the ones who can do it the best uh, are going to be the ones that succeed. Um, and hopefully we see that sooner rather than later. Um, but like you're right, it's it's navigating between applications, but it's also you know c- carrying on a conversation with the same application. Um, right now in Alexa, your skill is only active for like 16 seconds. So if you're not continuing that converse, carrying on that conversation continuously, uh, you have to re-invoke that application and start over every time you talk to it. Um, so like with the recipe example, if you're n- stepping through the steps in a recipe, you'd have to say, Alexa, ask the recipe app what the next step in the recipe is every time. Um, and that's less efficient than just saying, you know, Alexa, what's the next step? Well, there's, I mean, that robot game lets you stay in it until you exit it or die. So there, that's coming, right? I You don't know what the robot game is, and I don't remember the name, not, so that's, yeah. that's just not a good information, is it? I, I hope, I, I hope, I would imagine that they're improving that. Like it ju- just makes so much sense. So yes. hopefully that's something that's, that's happened um, and we'll continue to see improvements in that direction. And your your recipe app is exactly what we we need here. I mean, because once you can do that, once you can step through something that's a, a fairly linear process, then you can start stepping through things that aren't as linear. And even the linear process of having a recipe, at some point you're going to want to have a timer and it's it builds on itself and it does seem like someday we will get to conversation. This whole thing yeah. reminds me of those old Infocom games. Yes. From the eighties, those text adventures. And, Zork. and yeah, it's the same kind of problem of anticipating any kind of input where for years we've had, okay, there's a mouse pointer and a keyboard <laughs> yeah. and the keyboard has, you know, fixed set of key commands and the mouse points exactly where you want it to, to and now it's all, it's a completely different way of thinking about applications. And I think that's what's hard for people. Yeah. 
yeah, we're definitely in a transition phase. Um, and as kind of we learn best practices, and not only in the design, but in the kind of like architecture side of things, we're going to start seeing better and better uh, applications. Well, that sounds like it's a good place to start wrapping things up. Chris, do you have any last questions? Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask, since a lot of people who listen to the show are tinkers and you know electrical electrical engineering people and you know software people who make projects of their own or little might be exploring little Internet of Things projects. Um, what would you suggest if somebody said, "Hey, you know, I'd really like to hook voice recognition, speech recognition into my project or product." I don't know where to start. It wouldn't be making their own voice recognition system, but it would probably be hooking into uh, Amazon Echo's ecosystem or something. So where where would somebody start to look at that? Yeah, I think um, the Echo is a great place to start. It's I think it's the most open right now, and there's a lot of support for um, for kind of hooking it up to like more project type things with like if this then that and other services that you can use to to link up voice commands in your skill to to different um, devices in your home or projects you may be working on. Uh, so I would definitely go to um, Alexa um, developer pages, which I, I don't remember the URL off the top of my head. Um, there's also a pretty active um, f- developer forum there, which has a lot of tinkerers uh, and kind of more uh, hardware maker uh, type community uh, communities of people. Um, and there's also a Slack channel that they have. Um, so there's definitely a large developer community there. And that's probably where I would start. Alexa Skills Kit, it's developer.amazon.com and there will be a link in the show notes. All right. That sounds like fun, actually. Think of all the things you can make people do if you can interact with them voice-wise. Make people do? You're going to take over people now? Well, I think of all the things you can make them say. It would just be funny to have a game where you like had oh, to guess I the word and then I, I made you say you're, some quote or some stupid thing. you reverse double plus uh, upside down social engineering people. But yeah, you know. Got it. I, I, <laughs> you're going to write the code to make the people do things, not the other we're way gonna, around. We're going to have voice recognition change how people speak <laughs> instead of just recognizing things differently. It's going to have to change how I speak. Oh, well, Chris, thank you so much for being with us. Do you have any last thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Um, No, just thank you so much for having me. Uh, If you're interested in voice computing, especially uh, voice design, uh, definitely check out our prototyping tool. It's a great place to start playing around with um, designing voice experiences. And again, that's at uh, tincan.ai, T-I-N-C-A-N.ai. And that link will, of course, be in the show notes. Our guest has been Chris Mori, the founder of Conversant Labs, a company providing design and development tools to help create fully conversational applications for iOS and the Amazon Echo. I'd like to send a special thank you out to O'Reilly's Nina Cavinus for hooking me up with Chris. Their design conference is in San Francisco in March, March 2017. Wow, that's coming fast. Thank you also to Christopher for producing and co-hosting. And of course, thank you for listening. Hit the contact link on Embedded FM if you'd like to say hello, sign up for the newsletter, subscribe to the YouTube channel, enter the Tinker Kit contest, and don't forget, Alexa, play Embedded FM. All right, final thought, final thought. Uh, let's see. How about one from Helen Keller? Be of good cheer, Do not think of today's failures, but of the successes that may come tomorrow. You've set yourself a difficult task, but you will succeed if you persevere, and you will find a joy in overcoming obstacles. Remember, no effort that we make to attain something beautiful is ever lost. Embedded is an independently produced radio show that focuses on the many aspects of engineering. It is a production of Logical Elegance, an embedded software consulting company in California. If there are advertisements in the show, we did not put them there and do not receive money from them. At this time, our sponsors are Logical Elegance and listeners like you.